Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with episode numero siete of the Deng Xiaoping History Podcast. It took me only seven episodes to get through all 268 years of the Qing Dynasty when I did those dynasty overviews. And here I am, seven episodes, and all I have to show for myself are a little more than seven decades. I'm going to try and pick up the pace this time and encourage you if you're hungry for more details, to go out and buy Ezra Vogel's new book, Deng Xiaoping and the Transformation of China. I want to let everyone know my new podcast feed is up and running in the iTunes store. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the new China History podcast feed. It's the one where you'll see all 69 episodes available. You'll recognize the old feed that starts at episode number 18. I'm going to do maybe one more episode after this one, and then that old website that I made from scratch using iWeb and that podcast feed, both are going to be shut down. And then everything will be available from that point on at the new website, ChinaHistoryPodcast.com, and from the new iTunes feed. And again, sorry for all the hassles. Let's get going here. We're going to jump to the year 1980. This is the official year that the new Deng era begins. Specifically, it started at the 5th plenum of the 11th Party Congress, or Central Committee, in February 1980. As I mentioned last time, by the middle of 1979, Deng had already unofficially pushed Hua Guofeng to the side. This was a very great mismatch. Deng, with all his smarts, political astuteness, his relationships, the most Powerful of the most powerful men in China, the whole package. He just quietly steamrolled over Hua Guofeng to the extent that by this fifth plenum, Hua was no longer unofficially out. He was officially out. Hua was out, and Deng's two chief lieutenants were now in. Hu Yaobang, later on at the next plenum, became party chairman, and Zhao Ziyang became premier, two positions that were previously held by Hua. Hu Yaobang was put in charge of the restored party secretariat. It was the job of the secretariat to organize all the daily work of the Politburo and Standing Committee. They were like the um, cabinet of the party. But the most powerful position in the party, and for that matter in China as well, was chairman of the CMC, Central Military Commission, Deng Xiaoping kept this one for himself. By January 1980, Deng had already given his equivalent of his State of the Union address, where he laid out everything that needed to be done. And more, truer words were never spoken when Deng said in this historic speech in China, quote, modernization is the core to all major tasks because it is the essential condition for solving both our domestic and external problems. Everything depends on our doing our work in our country well. The role we play in international affairs is determined by the extent of our economic growth. And uh, as we see today, more than three decades after Deng made this speech, Deng Xiaoping hit the nail squarely on the head with uh, this remark. So Deng began laying down the law and explaining how things were going to be from now on. Anything that had the smell of the Cultural Revolution on it was shunned. Certain freedoms were allowed, but everything had to be said or written within the very narrow and limiting context of the four cardinal principles that we discussed uh, last time. Deng laid those out in 1979. Deng Xiaoping had come out and said, as long as everything was within the boundaries of the four cardinal principles, you know, we're cool. Nobody's going to come after you. Say whatever you want to say. The top layer of leadership was stuffed with Deng Xiaoping men. He wasn't going to be forced to deal with the High Wire Act. He had to perform with Chairman Mao breathing down his neck and constantly being careful not to offend anyone or any party principles. Now that the fifth plenum was out of the way, Deng Xiaoping no longer had any significant obstructions to slow him down or prevent him from carrying out his plans. And that was it. It all began about now, early 1980. And you can see from today's China... Deng's plans to revive industry, agriculture, and the military, eh, they work pretty good. It's right about now that all the party officials who had done well under the Cultural Revolution sort of got pushed out. Under the new Deng regime, if you were more red than expert, 
you weren't going to rise high in the party, the government, or the new economy. Deng opened the door wide to those officials who were experts and had something to contribute other than, you know, parroting the party line all the time. Those party officials, big and small, who had either a proven track record, a high degree of education, or practical experience, had a place in the world that Deng Xiaoping was trying to create. And there were a lot of these guys. I know I keep rattling off the same old names in these podcasts, but there were many, many more. So many good and decent party officials who were, you know, sort of in the mold of Deng in that they did their work diligently without fanfare and achieved results. And these guys had to lay low during the 10 years of chaos, as the Cultural Revolution was now being referred to. But now they were all coming back, and Dung was handpicking these guys and reading through dossiers and playing a hands-on role in assembling his team. And this is one of the reasons he was able to light that rocket in the 1980s and 90s. He picked the dream team of leaders who picked good party cadres, and with all the hardware in place... All Dung had to do now was load the software. Now, a lot of what happened once reform and opening up to the outside world kicked into gear was made up as they went along. But the game plan was set in stone at the fifth plenum. The Hu Yaobang, Zhao Ziyang team was put in place. Liu Shaoqi, who had been dead for 11 years, uh, his verdict was reversed. And with that, a terrible wrong was righted. It also signaled that Mao Zedong's day of reckoning was coming. But most of all, it consolidated Deng's power at the top. All the Hua remnants and undesirables left over from the Cultural Revolution were all, for the most part, out. This allowed everyone to sort of loosen up a little, relax, and not be so uptight about the job they had to do. Seems sort of natural to you and me, but after what these Chinese leaders and cadres had just gone through, it was, it was a whole new feeling. The 1980s we're sure starting to look like it was going to be a one good decade. You know, I haven't mentioned this yet, but for quite some time now, Deng's herring had been going. He was going deaf. So he really didn't bother going to too many meetings anymore. I mean, what was the use? He, he couldn't hear what anyone was saying. That's how bad it was. He worked out of his home about 10 minutes from Zhongnanhai. His proxy was none other than Wang Reilin, who had served as sort of a right-hand man for many years, going back to 1952. And when Deng was down, so was Wang Reilin. Now he was back, and although I guess you'd probably never heard of him, but Wang Reilin, for all these amazing years in the 80s, he was Deng Xiaoping's eyes and ears, and surely got to see a lot in his position as you know, Deng's office director. I found this quite interesting. Um, in Ezra Vogel's book, he details how Deng Xiaoping basically did his thing. You know, what was his daily routine? He would eat breakfast at 8 in the morning and hung out probably with Zhuo Lin, his wife. And then at 9, he went to his home office. Zhuo Lin, ever the soulmate and life partner of her husband, Deng Xiaoping. She was there with Wang Reilin, and they both, you know, arranged his papers, documents, newspapers, reports. Deng read 15 newspapers, you know, all China papers, mind you, and he was given a daily briefing with translations of key articles from the foreign press. Most of the day was consumed with perusing a whole slew of party documents from all levels of the party that had somehow managed to rise up to his supreme level. And all documents had to be in his hands by 10 a.m. the latest. And at the end of the day, Dung handed all the documents with his comments or approvals and handed this back to Zhuo Lin and Wang Rei Lin, and they were like, like the mailroom. They made sure everything got where it had to go. He kept no notes and kept no party documents lying about his house. The emperors of China, they, they pretty much operated the same way, you know, using the same principle. Worked well, certainly worked well for Deng Xiaoping. He met Chinese officials often at his home. But all foreigners would, you know, he would see them generally in one of the rooms at the Great Hall of the People off Tiananmen Square. With respect to decollectivizing agriculture and letting peasants do what they did best, Deng went out on a limb early on back in 1979. He advocated this whole notion of winding down all these communes and collectives, though he did it without fanfare and as low-key as possible. 
you know, it only affected about 700 million or so people. So, you know, he had to be careful. According to Ezra Vogel, he said where there were starving and the most hard up peasants, Dung said, let those guys do whatever they need to do to fend for themselves and get up off their knees. They don't have to follow the rules anymore. Whatever works, just go for it. It was okay to get them off these communes and let them till their own plots of land. By the mid-1980s, this bright idea had borne obvious fruit in terms of agricultural production increases. And Dung, being a pragmatist and all he said, if it worked in these cases, it's probably a good idea. So let anyone else who wants to do it grab a hoe and a plow and farm their own land. The story about how Deng's policies transformed agriculture in China in the 1980s and 90s is a rich one. And as for the city folk, Deng went out on a limb for them too. During the Cultural Revolution, a lot of city dwellers got sent down to the countryside to do a little labor, some lao dong, and learn from the peasants. Now that the whole unpleasantness of the Cultural Revolution was over, They were flowing back to the cities in droves. So Dung, again, being a practical man, said, even though this is pure capitalism, if some households want to form a small enterprise, then go ahead. It's okay. And there were, you know, there was some loophole in Das Kapital or something where Marx said, uh, you know, as long as you have less than eight employees, you know, nobody could call you a capitalist. So all these businesses, they just opened up overnight. One minute they weren't there, and then all of a sudden, everywhere. And these peoples were known as the Gati Hu. This was Dung at his best. And pretty soon, nobody cared about the under eight employee rule. Dung hadn't yet said to get rich is glorious yet. But I think that that built in entrepreneurial spirit that's encoded in the DNA of Chinese the world over was sort of activated like turning on a switch. So all these small businesses that sprung up around this time, they were a real phenomenon in the 1980s and contributed nicely to the growth of the local economies and for providing necessary goods and services. Another thing, let's give credit where credit is due. Who knows where the idea originated? Back in November 1977, Deng was in Guangdong province on party business, and the whole discussion began about, you know, spiffing up the area near Hong Kong and building an economy there that could provide jobs and a lifestyle for everyone and make it so that this endless stream of Chinese braving death or detention to cross that hideous polluted river that forms the 20-mile border with Hong Kong, you know, they'd stop doing that. So, so many illegals eager to escape the drudgery and seeming hopelessness of life in China would risk everything to get out and try their luck in Hong Kong. Deng knew then, in 1977, something special needed to be done regarding southern Guangdong to take advantage of having the full financial and economic might of Hong Kong on the doorstep. Deng knew Hong Kong was going to be the key to driving the prosperity of southern China. A lot of thought was put into what was the best way to take advantage of this blessing they had. So all the experimentation began, and as many of you are no doubt aware, Deng started first in the two most international provinces, going back to the beginning of Chinese recorded history. And they, of course, were Guangdong and Fujian province. And so it began the early 1980s, the Special Economic Zones. Created officially in August 1979, these areas took off like a supersonic rocket. And in 1978, the man who spearheaded all this in Guangdong province was none other than Mr. Xi Zhongxin. You may or may not have heard of him, but you'll be hearing a lot about his son in the coming year, for he is slated to be the next president of China. Xi Jinping, the right-hand man of Xi Zhongxin, who helped design and build the whole special economic zones, was none other than Gu Mu, who we discussed in last week's episode 6. Gu Mu was the resident expert in China, most familiar with the matter of foreign trade and investment. The rationale behind these special economic zones, or Te Chu, as they became known, was simple. China needed to expand economically through the building of a sound export manufacturing base. 
But China was so far behind and so out of touch with the world economy and advanced production methods and whatnot, they had to start from, from less than scratch. They had to start from the position of not even having the machines, technology, and techniques and know-how. So these SEZs, Special Economic Zones, were set up as a way to skirt all the regulations and restrictions involved in foreign trade. They were a shortcut to creating the environment to attract foreign investment, Western technology, you know, and know-how. And they couldn't just implement this policy in China just like that. So Deng did what he always did. He experimented first on a small scale. And if it worked, then the idea got folded into China national policy. So everything began in Guangdong and Fujian. Frankly speaking, these two provinces were the lucky ones. I mean, the gush of foreign capital and investment that came pouring in from Hong Kong, Taiwan, from the overseas Chinese of Southeast Asia and elsewhere, created this sea change in the towns and cities of the Pearl River Delta region in southern Guangdong and in the city of Xiamen in Fujian. In Guangdong, there were three SEZs set up. The biggest, of course, well, we all know this place, was Shenzhen. Then you also had Zhuhai to the west and Shantou to the east. And just as Shenzhen borders Hong Kong, Zhuhai, an hour or so away, bordered Macau. And then Shantou was next door to the city of Chaozhou, and it's the Chaozhounese, the Teochew people, who always vied with the Shanghainese for the traditional top spot as China's greatest entrepreneurs. So you might recall we featured Mr. Li Ka Xing in episode 13, one of the all-time great Chaozhou sons. This whole SEZ thing, it took a lot of guts to do. And obviously we can all see Deng's plan worked. It worked beyond everyone's wildest dreams. Now it worked, but that isn't to say... There weren't any problems or dangerous issues that surfaced. I guess the main problem was that 1979-1980, it was, it was so close to the conclusion of the Cultural Revolution. And now, suddenly, everyone was involved in actions that might have gotten yourself killed or struggled against. I mean, a few years before, you may have gotten in trouble, but now these taboo activities were now being encouraged. Guangdong province once they got the official go-ahead to start their engines, couldn't have embraced this new policy with more enthusiasm. And you know how it is. These, these southern Chinese down in those provinces of Guangdong, Guangxi, Yunnan, Fujian, historically, they were always so far from the political action up in the north, you know, in Xi'an, Zhengzhou, Beijing, Luoyang, and these ancient capitals. You know, the old saying, Tian Gao Huang Di Yuan, the heavens are high and the emperor is far away. Now, the Guangdong officials who were in charge of this whole thing, it's not like they totally ignored the central government, but man, they sure did some eyebrow-raising things. They were constantly being called out on a variety of things, but their powerful backers, most of all Deng, stood behind all these decisions, and, you know, this really took guts. How else can I describe what happened next? Foreigners, Hong Kong people, everyone who was in the manufacturing business. The whole center of the light industrial manufacturing universe suddenly shifted to southern Guangdong province. For the past, I don't know how many years, everything in the Chinese economy had been so carefully planned, carried out, statistics duly reported and whatnot. But now suddenly these special economic zones are invented and there's hardly even a ramp up period. It's like one minute it wasn't there and now it was and the whole thing worked. How can I say? Spectacularly. Deals were being made everywhere. And once the Guangdong and Fujian officials got the okay to sign deals without getting Beijing involved. Well, you know, you can imagine how much of a help that was. The whole instruction booklet about how Guangdong province was going to be run from now on with these, you know, special economic zones and whatnot was, it was so complicated and the taxes raised so vast and complicated. The central government just threw the book out and said to Guangdong, from now on, just give us one big, massive lump sum payment in lieu of all these other smaller taxes and, you know, we'll be okay. And it's right about now when 
unfettered capitalism came to southern China that you started to get a little pushback from the conservative wing of the party. Now, these were all Deng's old comrades, but they were very dead set against some of these policies. And even after they were instituted, these guys, these strict conservative types, central planners, every last one of them, they were against this. And the most notorious of all being Chen Yun. They were always trying to take precautions and were crying foul whenever something seemed to get out of hand. And Deng would do what he had to do to placate them, and bend to their will when he had to, but at the same time, keep the whole experiment going at full speed. Hey, Deng was an expert at this. Chen Yun and his ilk were not going to be much of an impediment to Deng. I mean, after all, he'd been pushing all these kinds of things going back to the early 60s and had Chairman Mao to contend with, always watching over his shoulder, ready to pounce and criticize. So, you know, dealing with the Chen Yuns, the Wang Jens, Deng Li Chuns, these guys were nothing compared to Mao. And Deng Xiaoping had his sights set on all these overseas Chinese all over Southeast Asia, especially the Hong Kong Chinese. This was going to be one magical additive to this experiment that Deng was certain would ensure its success. Fully two-thirds of all direct investment in China passed through Hong Kong. And this was all the way up to 1995. And I personally got thrown into the fray when I moved to Hong Kong in 1989. So I got to see all this stuff up close about a decade after the whole thing began. And any foreigner who lived in China then or was familiar with the situation could tell you nothing was like it. I mean, going from cities like Shenzhen, Dongguan, Guangzhou, Zhuhai, all these places that were, you know, within the field of gravity of Hong Kong, they were so bustling, fast-paced, and, well, you know, booming, you could see it everywhere. And then you'd go to places like Wuhan, Changsha, Nanjing, Nanchang, and it was nothing like this. So, so quiet, seemingly backward. It was like two urban Chinas existed, one inside the special economic zones and one outside. Two different worlds. It started off slowly, but within a few years of opening, it really left everyone outside the zones in the dust. And it was right about now when a lot of people began to worry about all the spiritual pollution that might seep out of Guangdong and affect the narrower provinces. Who got into the SEZs was carefully controlled, and you couldn't just hop on a train back then and head south to Shenzhen. Like I said, Deng created these SEZs as experiments only. Believe me, there were lots of things the central government didn't like, and they were constantly trimming around the edges to adjust policies, you know, according to whatever the situation was. And the Guangdong officials, once they had been unchained, they weren't too amenable to listening to all these interfering party officials from Beijing trying to tone down this and tone down that. Deng Xiaoping placed a lot of his chips on Hong Kong. It was the perfect place, situated on the southern border of China, cosmopolitan, an advanced economy, financial international trading center. Deng knew this, and he really focused a lot on how Hong Kong could truly be a locomotive that could drive the success of the SEZs and bring China to the next level. And that's exactly what happened. When you consider there was barely $10 billion dollars in foreign trade up until the SEZs were put in place, and now there's like over a trillion. It's like, hey, not bad. These special economic zones, this was one of Deng Xiaoping's greatest achievements. And when you say he transformed China, this is one of the ways he did it. Not everyone agreed with Deng that this was a good idea, and just like the days of Prince Gong back in the Qing dynasty, not everyone was all hot and heavy to embrace the West and open up so fast and so boldly. Deng was the one who put his whole neck, his whole position as a leader, not to mention his legacy, on the line to see this thing through. And he had a guy named Ren Zhongyi serve as the general manager, so to speak, for this whole experiment in Guangdong, Everyone gives Deng Xiaoping credit for all the amazing things that happened in Guangdong province during the 1980s. Now, Deng didn't actually micromanage this. He created the political atmosphere that allowed all this to happen. It was Ren Zhongyi, another very highly regarded party member, who actually did all the dirty work. He was the party secretary from 1980 to 85, and if there was any 
single hero of the early days of the opening up in Guangdong, Ren Zhongyi was the guy. He died six years ago, but the and a lot of people in China liked his outspoken views and willingness to re-examine certain sacred cows of party ideology. Now, Deng Xiaoping was definitely getting his way, but that isn't to say no one was opposing him. There was a lot of resistance. With all this money and wealth suddenly flooding into these two lucky provinces, Guangdong and Fujian, it was only natural, people being people and all, that a huge amount of corruption would make itself at home in the system. As the Chinese sometimes say, you can't wrap a fire with paper. The scale of the bribery and the rumors that got out eventually made their way to Beijing, and the I told you so's came fast and furious. Yeah, there sure was a lot to point your finger at that wasn't good. You had a lot of high-profile cases of everyone taking a piece, just like Chen Yun warned. So Deng allowed Phase 1 to complete before he began Phase 2 of the SEZs in 1984. The greatest resistance against the SEZs came in the beginning. Deng made sure Chen Yun and his conservative faction and their birdcage economics were, you know, given face and allowed to put the brakes on to some extent. But by 1984, Deng saw an opening and took a grand tour of the South visiting all the SEZs, listening to reports, meeting with officials, and more or less drumming up support for his next big idea, which was to open up 14 additional coastal cities and let these places operate using many of the same policies that worked so good in Shenzhen, Zhuhai, Shantou, and Xiamen. This was when he came up with the famous Dengism, Socialism with Chinese characteristics. He was always the consummate politician. What a line. I don't want to dwell too much on the special economic zones and the 14 additional coastal cities. I think you get the main point. This was the method Deng employed. It wasn't perfect, but it worked. And after a period of time, and all the kinks were ironed out, these policies were extended further and further until, well until everything sort of reached the point that it has today. These great things going on in the SEZs were all fine and good, but China was still, at that time, 80% rural. And these nongmin, or peasants, hadn't had it easy since the mid-50s. Well, their happy day came in 1980. Policies Deng put in place with his deputies, Wan Li, Zhao Ziyang, Hu Yaobang, Leading the way, they brought huge relief to this segment of the peasantry who first got a taste of the reforms. The collectives were all wound down slowly, and from that point on, it was all done the way it should have been, letting individual households manage their farms. I mean, they've been doing it for 4,000 or more years. You'd figure they wouldn't need any help from the central government on this subject. These policies Dung put in place are still being used today. And then all these enterprises started spontaneously springing up in all the villages and towns of, you know, the five strongest provinces, Guangdong, Fujian, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, and Shandong. This led to all kinds of smaller scale local economies. No one thought about it at first, but Deng saw that there seemed to be no downside to this. So these TVEs, as they became known, township village enterprises, They became policy, too. And this, of course, led to the next natural step, which was for individual enterprises, basically the stock and trade of entrepreneurs. So you can see how everything led to everything, and you could see the built-in strength and toughness of the Chinese, you know, having taken a severe beating after the Great Leap and the Cultural Revolution. Deng Xiaoping puts all these things in place and uses his preeminence to forced these policies into effect. And this created the necessary environment that allowed the natural industry and business savvy of the Chinese themselves to thrive and make the whole thing work. There was a ton of planning that went into everything these economic planners came up with. But the truth of the matter was that everything in these new areas they were doing was was terra incognita. But the truth of the matter was, everything they were doing was terra incognita. So they had to just make it up as they went along and discard the bad, keep the good, keep trying new things. And that's really how things went. There were so many dynamics 
all happening at the same time. So many ingredients to the soup, the, the, you know, the recent history of China, reaction against old policies, rapid changes going on in the world economically, China's new relationship with the U.S. and other Western nations, you know, Hong Kong, Macau, the ASEAN nations, the whole international network of Hua Chiao businessmen doing business in China, everything all mixed together. Of course, it was only natural that all these anomalies would come up, but hey, look at China today. You know, I guess it worked. And while all this was going on, another feather in Deng Xiaoping's cap was being hammered out between the government of Great Britain and China over the future of Hong Kong. Now, Deng let it be known from the get-go that as far as what would happen after 1997, when the lease ran out, the decision was already made, and all that had to be worked out were the details. This is one of the great tales of foreign diplomacy, drama, and negotiation. Now, I'll cover the handover of Hong Kong in a future podcast, but Deng was determined to take back Hong Kong and reverse the humiliation of the Opium War. And on September 26, 1984, the Joint Declaration was signed, which sealed Hong Kong's fate after 1997. And believe me, plenty of people freaked out, and there were a lot of people who fled Hong Kong or resigned themselves to the worst-case scenario. But 14 years after the handover and 27 years after the signing of the Joint Declaration, None of these doomsday scenarios came even close to happening. Following the joint declaration, the basic law was signed five years later on February 21st, 1989. So the 1980s was really a decade of achievement for Deng Xiaoping. But it wasn't always a smooth ride. Everything was going great for Deng with all the opening up and reform. The economic and financial figures were amazing. But when 1988 rolled around... The invincible Deng Xiaoping, at the age of 84, hit a major rough patch. Now, what triggered this? Price controls, that's what did. Or actually getting rid of price controls and letting market forces affect which direction prices go. Deng thought no one would mind much, but the people did, and they let it be known. They liked the old system. This is the first time you see something go awry in a pretty big way. Deng had to back down when all was said and done. Not his best moment. His prestige was diminished not only in the government, but in the eyes of the people as well. One of Deng's people, Zhao Ziyang, had to step down as premier. And it's right here where we see Li Peng take over as premier of China. And so in late 1988, this is the famous hard landing that China had that Everyone keeps talking about now. Soft landing, hard landing, who knows? But late 1988, China hit the ground hard, and inflation caused no small amount of hardship. You know, the famous China patented automatic double-digit economic growth dropped like a stone. It was 4.1% in 1989 and 3.8% in 1990. Now, all along, Deng's nemesis, the yin to his yang, had been none other than Chen Yun. Chen was a year younger than Deng, which made him 84, 85, when all this drama was going down. And this period, where some experiments blew up in Deng's face, this was all Chen Yun needed to take over the controls and ratchet things down to something a lot more conservative and slow going. Later on in 1989, June 4th to be exact, less than four months after the Basic Law was passed, Another incident happened in Tiananmen Square, this time the June 4th incident. We're going to focus in on this event at another time, but suffice to say, on top of all the bad economic news in China, all the high drama in Hong Kong, when June 4th went down, Deng Xiaoping had to have been feeling the heat. Never before had the criticism been so scathing and so direct. And as far as all the details go about the personal attacks against Deng and everything he faced dealing with the hardliners or Chen Yun people, you know, the usual cast of detractors, they had all along been a stone in Deng's boot. They finally got their way and made fast work of Hu Yaobang and his policies. And of course, we know Zhao Ziyang, he was never heard from again since uh, even before the June 4th incident. These were Deng's two key people, and they both 
didn't survive politically. And Hu Yaobang died suddenly in April of 1989. And just as Zhou Enlai's passing led to the events that happened on April 5th, 1976, the same could be said of Hu Yaobang's death and the events that led up to and culminated in the June 4th incident of 1989. 1989 brought Jiang Zemin to the fore. Not many had ever heard of him before, but all of a sudden, Deng made him paramount leader. Deng was now, in 1989, starting to make the necessary preparations just in case he might suddenly pass away, which in 85-year-old lifelong chain smokers was uh, known to happen. The whole second half of Ezra Vogel's book deals with all the details that I've been skimming and even jumping over. The minutia is fascinating reading. And if you're interested to get the nitty-gritty of all the reforms and politics and details of that amazing decade in China, Ezra Vogel certainly delivers. Let's put the brakes on right here. I feel confident we'll be able to finish this one off in the next episode. All we have left is the aftermath of 1989 and then Deng's 1992 southern trip, Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was living in Hong Kong when that marquee event happened. We'll look at that next time. We'll look at Dung's final years and his legacy. And after next week's episode, we'll get back to the usual routine and try and release some, you know, more random episodes. One more time, I have the new feed available at ChinaHistoryPodcast.com. This uh, feed leads you to the entirety of the China History Podcast archive. This is the new official feed to the podcast. If you're still using the old one, please subscribe to the new one. I'm going to shut the old one down sooner or later. Anywho, Christmas is behind us. Just have the New Year and then Chinese New Year. This is a very disruptive and always dicey period in my little manufacturing and export world. Everyone over here in the U.S. is consumed with the holidays and progress slows. And then when things start to crank up here in the U.S., the Chinese side is starting to put the brakes on and prepare for the 10-day or so shutdown and all the festivities of the spring festival holiday period. So many things go wrong starting right about now. And then after Chinese New Year, a quarter of the workers won't come back and it'll cause the usual scramble to find the scarcer and scarcer Chinese factory workers. I guess this is the last podcast of 2011. So a happy and healthy new year to every last one of yous. Thanks for listening. Sorry, this one's a little later than usual. You know, the holidays. Join me next week if you've nothing better to do for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.